Hello and welcome back to this relaxed Regency series where I take you through the making of my 1820s little Dorrit project using Laughing Moon pattern 138. I have lots of other videos about this project so I shall provide you with links to those if you should like to start this little series from the beginning because this video is about the making of the dress itself or rather it's about the making of the dress bodice. At the time I hadn't really realised it but the making of this project was mammoth and as a result the construction of this dress is much too long to fit into one video so I've split it up into more manageable chunks. This whole project started as a sew along to help me through a difficult time with my health. So there is also a playlist of wonderful videos that other people have made about this pattern and other Regency garments that I shall link you to. But first of all, we need to talk about this bodice. Now the bodice for Laughing Moon 138 is very straightforward. In fact, you might call it basic. <laughs> Now there's nothing wrong with that, it's historically accurate and leaves you a lot of room to play with trim and decoration, but as I had made the decision to enter this dress into a competition, I knew I needed a little more construction complexity than just two darts. I was constructing this like I would a costume for a film, and one of the things about film costumes is you get a lot of waist up close ups, so this should be where the focus of the decoration should be. And as a lot of decoration in the Regency era is self fabric, which sometimes can get lost on camera, I decided to go for a textured approach. I traced off the pattern and then manipulated that one big dart into what I hoped would be a sun ray shaped row of tucks. I pinned the pattern piece into shape on the dress form and notice I had this excess volume at the armhole so I decided I would need to twirl this new design. I really loved the way these tucks looked when pinned in but when I made up the twirl I really wasn't happy with it and went with something else, as I shall now explain in this very foggy and incoherent vlog footage. So I've been beavering away today and I've had my Christmas tunes on, on my phone and I film on my phone so I completely forgot to film anything today. Um, I was just rocking out <laughs> to the Christmas music so I thought it's it's coming towards the end of the day now so I thought I'd do a little summary of what I've been up to today because um, I've made quite good progress. My mock-up now has a sleeve. I'm not thrilled with the volume of the sleeve Really, I'd like I'd like more, I think, but um, that depends on how much fabric I have, and as I need a lot of the fabric for piping and decoration, I'm going to try and just live with it. I think because I'm I'm going to have the long under sleeve as well, the Mary sleeve. Hopefully, that will give it a bit more impact in this area. But yeah, I changed the bodice. So this bodice is based on one in Janet Arnold. This one. Because my previous bodice I thought was too subtle, particularly... So the fabric that I'm using for this project is cotton sateen and it's quite heavy weight and I don't think that delicate little tucks is really going to work with that. So um, I've gone for this more defined, exaggerated so these are cartridge pleats and these are gathers at the top and um, I've altered it ever so slightly because it's a bit pouchy for the final but with the weight of the skirt that should sit quite nicely over the bosom. I've also been working on, this is going to be a detachable pelerine so I've got this, so my bodice I've put in this yoke and I've seen this on quite a few extant examples actually from later in the 1820s. So this neckline is going to be piped and this seam is going to be piped, the armholes are going to be piped, everything's going to be piped. And so my plan is that with the double layer sleeves as well, I'm going to have two outfits in one so I can take the pelerine off and um, the under sleeves and have a short sleeve evening dress. And um, with that, I can tack the under sleeves back in and I can put the pelerine on and we've got a walking dress, a day dress. What else have I worked on today? Oh yeah, so patterning the pelerine took quite a lot of work because I wanted to make sure I got the proportion right with the ruffle and I'm going to have a little chemisette collar as well which I also cut out today. So yeah, the collar of the chemisette will be sheer over the purple and that, should, that will also have a ruffle which will hopefully sit inside this ruffle so it's going to be really ruffly. That's about all the progress I've made today. I mean that makes it sound like I haven't achieved a lot but I've 
re-patterned the front. I made my second front bodice mock-up. The back I'm keeping the same. I re-patterned it, tweaked the pattern again, patterned the pelerine. I cut the sleeve from this calico because this is going to, I'm going to use this, I'm going to starch this and use that as an interlining for the sleeves to get more volume. So I've made quite good progress. Ooh. I'm doing these Mary sleeves. So the sleeves will have the bands and then they're gonna have really trim at the cuff, just bands of it. And then the skirt hem is gonna have these big Rulu, um, this type of Rulu, you know, padded Rulu. This shape scallops scallops because this is a now a little doric costume i wanted to incorporate some more like um do i mean semantics i don't know what i mean some like design choices you know this dress like this costume is kind of from a moment in little dorrit's in the story of little dorrit where they're out of they've gone out of debtors britain <laughs> they've gotten out of debtors prison and um, the Dorrit family uh, living the high life, they're really enjoying their wealth, trying to fit in into society. And little Dorrit, the young Amy Dorrit, is really struggling with that, you know, and she keeps getting told off by her family for acting like a servant. And, you know, she's, she can't get used to having people wait on her hand and foot and, um, you know, not talking to her old friends and things like that. So even though she's now free from the prison, this new life is just as confining for her so i wanted to represent that as well in this costume despite all the wealth and finery she's still not free from the shadow of the debtor's prison so i mean yeah i'm including these little um allegorical details i think that was the word i was looking for earlier i'm excited to cut the fabric and really get started because the trimming is going to take an age so <laughs> once i've actually got a dress ready and made up i'll feel like i've you know made good progress i'm hoping to have it made up by the end of the year and then january can be decoration embroidering my at and making a bonnet which i'm excited about so um from weinachten <laughs> i guess with my pattern pieces finalized i started cutting them out in batches I actually cut the big skirt panels first but more of that another time so i used the off cuts to cut the yoke pieces then in my next batch, I cut the rest of the pattern pieces, including all of the decorative cuffs and the sleeves. I really love this moment when you get the effect of the negative space like this after cutting. Oh, so pretty. Anyway, I transferred all the markings to the newly cut out pattern pieces using carbon paper and a tracing wheel, and then took apart my mock-up to use as flat lining. I simply overlocked the two layers together. The next thing to cut was all the bias strips I would need to make the piping. I just chalked these on using a set square and then cut them with scissors. I actually did a lot of maths to figure out exactly how much piping I would need for each seam, so I had an approximate idea of how many bias strips to cut. To make up the piping, rather than join all those strips together and then make one giant length of continuous piping, I measured each seam that needed piping and then cut the cord to the right length. I then matched each length of cord with a bias strip that was approximately the right length. Sometimes I could get two lengths of piping out of one bias strip. In the end, I only ended up with one seam in the piping, which I strategically chose for the bottom of the belt as I thought that was the least obvious place for it. So then I had to make up all those little bits of piping. This I did with my zipper foot and just rolling one edge over. I didn't sandwich the piping in the middle, I offset the seam allowances slightly to save on fabric and so I didn't have to cut one edge down later to reduce bulk. I then pinned those lengths of piping to the sewing lines of their corresponding seams and then carefully machined them on again with a zipper foot. With the piping machine done, I could begin pinning everything together. Whoa, whoa geez, that's bright, okay. Here, we, we skipped a bit because the footage was hurting my eyes. I then machined the panels together, also using the zipper foot. 
What you can't see here, because my hand is in the way, is that I am carefully stitching just to the left of the line of stitching for the piping, so that the machine sewing for the piping won't be seen on the outside of the garment. I then press that curved seam over a tailor's ham. The next step was to construct the bodice front. I began by marking on the cartridge pleat placement every half a centimetre. I used two lines of gathering stitches for the cartridge pleating, so marked on a second line. Using a heavy buttonhole thread for strength, I stitched a running stitch along the pleating line, weaving the needle in and out of those half centimetre chalk marks I had just made. I then repeated this for the second row of gathering stitches. For the top edge of the bodice, I used machine gathering, turning up the stitch length and turning down the tension and sewing two rows of stitches next to each other. I'm using the zipper foot here just because I couldn't be bothered to change back to my ordinary presser foot. I then pulled up those gathers to the correct length and gave them a good stroke with a pin to make them lie nice and flat and even. Then using my zipper foot again and holding the bottom edge of the white flat lining out of the way, I machined the yoke to the bodice front, carefully stitching over the gathered sections. I then did the rest of the bodice construction, the shoulder seams, again stitching just outside the stitching line for the piping, and the side seams, which weren't piped. I pressed all those seams open, then I turned under the edge of the flat lining to hide the raw edges of the yoke join, before pressing and pinning it in place. Then I felled down the fold with a double thread for strength. I could have slip stitched it, but I thought the fell looked more historically accurate and would probably be firmer. I machined on the piping carefully easing around the curves of the armhole. This was quite bulky, particularly over the seams that had already been piped, so I went very slowly. Oh wait, was that last bit the neckline and this is the armhole? I, I can't tell, but either way, I repeated the process to also finish the neckline. For one of the armholes, my piping ended up being too short. I'm not sure how that happened, seeing as I did all that careful measuring, but boy was that annoying. But I will let past Claude express that frustration. So it turns out the piping I made for one armhole fits, but it's just, and I mean just by millimetres too short for the other armhole. So I've got this bit of piping which is no good to me. And unfortunately, this is all the piping cord I have left. It means I'm going to have to buy more piping cord and make more piping before I can finish the armholes and get on with the sleeves. So obviously we're in lockdown still in the UK, which means I'm going to have to order it online. Uh, so it's going to take days, possibly a week to arrive. Oh God. And that's the thing really with a bodice, when you get to the point where you're about to put in the sleeves, there's not much else you can do. But I, have, I was able to get one armhole piped and the neckline. So I've got to snip these and press them round and all of that and catch stitch them down. It's just really frustrating because I mean I've got a, I've got a lot of work to do on the sleeves. I've got to make and trim the sleeves and I've got to trim the skirt. So there's definitely things I can do whilst I'm waiting for my piping to arrive. It's just so annoying. So annoying. Why this much? I was this close. Oh god. While I waited for the piping to arrive, I finished the centre back edge of the bodice, turning back the seam allowance and herringboning the facing in place. I also marked and chalked on the centre back line for the placement of the fastenings, but I didn't sew those on until after I had joined the bodice to the skirt. 
Even with me making the bodice construction 10 times more complicated than it needed to be, this was a really simple bodice to construct. You've got those curved back seams, which can be tricky, and all that piping of course complicates things further. But in fact, the bodice of this pattern is really quite straightforward. That being said, Remember, I am a trained costume maker, so I basically didn't look at the instructions at all. But the few times I did, they did seem thorough and easy to understand. In terms of fit, I found the fit to be pretty good. You may remember from the undergarments video that I had to make the front panel pieces several sizes smaller than the back pattern pieces. But I highly suspect that's more to do with my body and not a reflection on the way this pattern actually fits. So I think this is a good place to leave this project for this video. The next video will take you through the trials and tribulations I had with the not one, but two sets of sleeves I had for this outfit. And then there will be subsequent videos covering the making and the trimming of the skirt, and also the making of the bonnet. So all that's left to say is, thank you very much for watching, see you next time!